trouble hearing me, let me know. Uh, and the audio guy said if you could set one up really quickly. We good? Excellent. Okay, great. So, um, getting right to it. So, uh, Michael actually hit all these high points. Sorry, I didn't realize that there was going to be a, an introduction thing going on. I will talk a little bit about uh, Adiance, just getting started really quickly. So, what it is that, that we are. Um, very small consulting company. Uh, we also do uh, iOS, Android, Rails development. We help companies to sort of get their software projects on track, get their business aligned with their technology, help to make them successful. Uh, we're not typical sort of outsourced developers. We don't like to go in, in, in sort of very agile sense, we don't like to go in and solve problems for people. We like to ask questions and you know, help bring more knowledge to the table, but then help them solve problems and walk away with our customers being more successful and, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, more knowledgeable and more capable of carrying on their projects by themselves. Um, I myself, uh, as Michael said, uh, about 18 years in software development, about 10 years in management, um, about 8 years agile-ish. Um, I am a nerd about just about everything, um, cars, technology, watches, music, Name it. If it's interesting to me, I'm a nerd about it, and I have an opinion about it. Uh, and I will argue, but I also really love to learn. So uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, part of the outcome of this conference and you know, my presentation also is that I learn a bunch of stuff from you guys today. And so today, what am I going to cover? I'm going to cover visual design, kind of, and software architecture, kind of. Uh, I'm going to talk about examples and approaches, uh, things that have worked for me. Uh, I don't, I'm not bringing negative examples to this. I'm just talking about things, patterns that have worked. Uh, I have a long, long, long list of anti-patterns as well. If people want to talk about those things, very happy to do so. Um, but I'm recently learning to frame things in a more positive way. So that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, I will not be talking about specific platforms, languages, protocols, etc. cetera. Um, not a language bigot, not a platform bigot. I do use a Mac, but that doesn't mean that I hate Windows. Um, I am, in fact, making this presentation in, uh, <clears throat> not in the, uh, the uh, Apple product, whatever that called. I don't even remember. Uh, this is, um, what is the Microsoft one called? PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Thank you. This is PowerPoint. Uh, I won't be covering specifics of just about anything. Um, if you think of architecture diagrams and the bit in the middle, it's a cloud. It's basically more or less what I'm going to be talking about. If you want to get into the specifics of any of the things that I'm touching on, by all means, shout, whatever you need to do, throw things at me. Um, we'll, be, we'll talk about stuff. So, step one. As we all know, Agile doesn't mean that we don't write everything down. Uh, and it applies to more than just software. I think we all know that too. Um, I think it's interesting to me because I've uh, had a couple of conversations around the, the table this morning actually uh, about you know, people who are still having challenges getting organizations to accept Agile um, you know, and who have brought Agile into the engineering group and you know, had training in the engineering group but the rest of the business has no idea what's going on. And so there's this huge impedance mismatch between the business and, and this, this Agile execution team and, and Michael and I were actually just having a conversation about that and, and Dave as well. So it's, um, I think it's important to understand that uh, the business doesn't think the same way that developers do. And developers don't think the same way that business does. Uh, and that's been a, one of the huge challenges in my career is making the change from development, no, that's wrong, this is not how we do this, this you know, that won't work. Uh, this is the right way to, okay, you're asking me to do something, the business is asking me to do something, why is the business asking me to do this? Why is the customer asking me to do this? And this is the mindset switch between agile and between traditional methods of development and implementation, in my opinion. Uh, it's the implied mindset switch that I think is not well communicated, not well understood, and not well lived, because it requires you to ask questions not to be told an answer, and that's hard. We want, to have an, we want to have an answer, but at the end of the day, Agile is about questions, and successful products are about questions. 
I expect this to be something of a controversial slide. <laughs> what we do before we build software, we design it. Don't skip this step. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you're building a system and you don't think about a system, you'll never have a system. If you break everything down into really small chunks and you never think about the larger pieces, you will never have something that works as a system. <coughs> that is my experience. I'm making a statement of fact based on my experience. That's not necessarily fact. Some people, I'm sure, have successfully built huge scalable enterprise systems by thinking about everything in one or two big chunks. And more power to them, that's never worked for me. Uh, I've never seen it work in any of the teams that I've worked with. And so this is why I think many of us say Agile-ish. Because at the end of the day, sticking to, sticking to Agile as rules is an ineffective way to look at it. It's a framework. It's a thought framework. So that being said, we don't just descend into designing a thing. First, we need to figure out what it is that we're building. We need to learn everything that we can. And so, well, if we're smart, anyway. Um, it's certainly easy to descend and directly design and go, oh, I know exactly what that's going to look like. We need an XYZ elevator and go to your boxes and lines and come up with a diagram. This is what it is. And then go to your code. And, that's what it is. And we've all done it. It doesn't work. So, what do we do first? Everybody's heard about Lean, presumably. This is not a new concept. Um, perhaps there are many questions around what Lean means. I think Lean is very much like Agile in that it's a mindset. It's really, what is it? it it's, a, it's an approach to the full business. It's an Agile approach to the full business. So we're now taking the concept of learn, try, fail, learn, try, fail to the business. I don't use fail as a bad word, it's not. Fail means that we're learning things. It means we're trying things. And if we don't admit that we're failing, it's awfully bad. So what do we do first? We test our assumptions, right? We want to make sure that we are actually doing a, this thing that I think will it work. I think people are interested in this presentation. And if I give it, will they like it? And then actually do the things, testing your assumptions. Don't talk about testing your assumptions. And, and then you know, go and build a single sheet design and go, this is what we need, and not put it in front of customers. Um, will you pay me for this is a really good type of feedback. Money is a great form of feedback. That doesn't just mean for small startup organizations. Huge enterprise organizations can use that as a type of feedback as well. You, know, you have companies that have internal divisions that need to outsource work to each other, or you know, mid-sized companies that have maybe an engineering team of 30 people and the rest of the company is 100 people. Will you pay me for this to your internal client? Is this something that you will be happy with having spent the money on if I give this to you? It's really valid feedback. And most of us don't ask it. So we ask a lot of questions. We write down the answers. We understand the answers. We talk to our customers. This is important. Don't build what you want, right? This is the other, the other thing of Lean. We think that we are Steve Jobs, and we can predict what the customers will want, and we're going to build that thing. We're not. We can't. That's OK. We need to figure out what our customers want. We need to begin, you know, when we begin designing, we need to know what it is that the end is going to be. Not the end end. But this part, the end of this part, what it is that we're doing right now. We need to accept that our goals are going to change. And you know, we need to understand which bits are going to be hard. If we don't understand those things, we will fail. This is the thing that makes upfront design an important part. We don't try to necessarily solve all these problems up front. We just need to know what's going to be complicated before it bites us in the ass. And then, of course, we have to understand our customers. Of course. And so the next step, while we're involved in designing. So that's what we do before. This is what we're doing during. We're going to continue to learn. We're going to iterate our design as we're doing it. We're going to take an agile approach to coming up with a design that we can take an agile approach to implementing and iterating a design. 
So again, while we're designing, remember that our goals are going to change, because they will as we go. We're going to start designing features that customers will pay for, because those are the important features. Features that people will not pay for are not important. It doesn't matter what you do if you're if you're spending time on something that people aren't going to pay you for, you're wasting time. Your time, your company's time, your customer's time. It's a bad idea. I recommend not doing it. You figure out what your modules are, right? We start prioritizing modules. Why do we want modules? We want modules because we don't want to design the system as a whole necessarily, every part of it. We don't want to build the system as a whole. We don't want to take you know, say, oh, we're going to be agile and then come up with this huge waterfall plan and this huge system design for something that we don't fully understand yet. We want to go piece by piece, feature by feature, module by module. Uh, it, this sounds like service-oriented architecture. It is. I love SOA. I think it is the best way to build software. Come at me. You get bits to your customers early. We all know this, right? We've all, we've, everybody in the room, yes, we've all delivered something early to the customer, gotten feedback, it's, that's the shittiest thing I've ever seen. I'll never pay you for that. We've gone back and done something else, right? Everybody's done this? I hope so. It's really, really humbling. You thought you learned a lot when you asked them all the questions, and you're like, this is what I heard, and they say, you didn't hear right. <laughs> Again, money is great feedback that doesn't lie. You build something, you sell it, that's fantastic. You did a good job. So, we need to figure out what the highest complexity part of our system is. Is there a specific workflow that when we're talking about it, hey, we need to be able to you know, sort by whatever. And then we all assume that this is possible. Does it turn out that this is actually far more complex than you thought? Can you prove that it's simple? Can you talk it through as a group and say, we know exactly how we're going to implement this? Will it stand up to being questioned? Will you ask each other questions? This is an important aspect of design, is sitting down with your, the whole group, everybody that's going to be responsible for implementation. This includes designers, architects, visual designers, UX, and talking through problems. This is a problem. This is a solution set. Will it work? I don't know. What about, what about, what about, what about? Write things down. Draw things. Argue. I love arguments. Arguments are good. Arguments make strong ideas stronger, and they kill weak ones. Weak ideas have no place in anything that any of us are writing. Whiteboards are your best friend. If you don't like whiteboards, go love them. They're very, very useful. They're old and terrible tools in many ways, but if you can't draw an idea, then you probably don't understand how to solve it. Use everything that you can to collect data about what it is that you're trying to do. You think a problem is easy to solve? Does somebody else not think that it's easy to solve? Fantastic. Build a prototype. Put your money where your mouth is. Spend three hours with your compiler. Prove that you can solve the problem. I don't care what compiler it is. Is your target platform .NET and you figure you can solve this in three hours on Ruby? Go for it. That's fine. Prove that the problem is solvable. Make sure that everybody understands what the solution looks like. Now, to solve all of it in the design phase, you just need to prove that it can be solved. And if you can prove that it can be solved, don't go any deeper on it. You just prove that you have a solvable problem. There's no point in going any deeper on the design. Don't waste your time that way. But stuff that does look big, that looks heavy, that looks complicated, go as deep as you have to to be confident that you can solve the problem. Everybody knows the thing that pisses off business the most is it's going to take longer than I thought. And if you go from two weeks to two months to six months because you didn't properly understand the problem, that's your fault. That's not the business, not accepting Agile. That's the fault of you and your design team not understanding the problem before you went to solve it. I've done that a lot of times. I've been the guy between the development team and the business saying, sorry guys, we're going to be a little late on this one. It's never a fun place to be. And it's worse as a developer. All we want to do is solve problems, right? We want our customers to be happy. Customers are not happy when things that are unexpected happen. And of course, we agree that Agile means we're adapting to unexpected things. But it behooves us to figure out 
what that is to reduce the risk as much as possible. So Agile, in many ways, I think is reducing risk to, uh, you know, to delivering it all. I think that a little bit of upfront design reduces risk to delivering late. And contrary to popular opinion, delivering on time is not a bad thing. It makes people very happy. Uh, also, iterative design is good. You can't iterate on all parts of your design. If you iterate on every bit of your design, again, you will never have a cohesive system. And systems that are not cohesive are bad. Usually. But, you know, you, you, you iterate development where you need to. So, useful architecture is incomplete. Architecture that is complete is not. It never is, right? Upfront design never works 100%. You can't design every bit of the product, you can't architect every bit of the system. It will never work because you will have unexpected things. You'll have untested assumptions. So, flexible, lightweight, not finished. Everybody knows how to solve specific types of problems. Let's talk about how to be a successful architect. We start by drawing a picture of the system. Everybody loves system architecture diagrams. I also love system architecture diagrams. They don't have to be very complicated, but you need to be able to draw the system on a whiteboard, in Visio, you know, on a rock with a hammer, I don't care. You need to be able to draw a picture of the system, elaborate your idea. Make sure that it's modular, because you're going to be approaching your implementation in a modular way. Your design should also be modular. Again, I, service orientation is good. Again, I love it. Come at me about it. I really want to have an argument about that subject. Um, specifically, and I think we've all experienced this as well, highlight your points of interaction. If you're taking a you know, modular approach to design and development, you know integration is going to be a bitch. So make it as easy as possible. Any place where you need to have modules interact with one another, make sure that you understand what that looks like. Draw it. Write it down. Try it out. Define your API. Put some data through it. Go, yeah, that doesn't work very well. So refine it. Do something different. Talk to people and argue about it. Have a conversation. If you don't talk with your team, they're not going to understand what you're trying to do. And again, this is not just architecture, not just architects, not just developers. This is UX, this is visual design. Everybody who's involved in executing on the product needs to be involved in all phases of this project. You will be, <coughs> if you've never had a visual designer or a UX in a UX strategist in a meeting with developers say, that API design is really interesting, but I don't think it supports this workflow that we require. That is a powerful experience. And I'll tell you, the first time that that happened to me, it was like absolute shivers down my back and I went, holy crap, can you come to every one of these meetings, please? They're stakeholders too. They're responsible for the design. You don't have somebody on your team who's responsible for how the customer is interacting with your product, elect someone or elect yourself. It's really important. It's really important. It doesn't matter if what you're building is just an API with a database. It's a huge uh, you know, HTML site, mobile app, whatever. Somebody has to understand how the customer is going to work with your product. And they need to be able to speak to things from that perspective. This is a thing that we've learned from Agile, I think. But it's still amazing how many times we don't do it ourselves. and then carefully diagram the complex bits, especially workflows. Workflows are, this is the thing I think that gets missed a lot in architecture so and in design. So we have visual design, we have a user experience design, we have an architecture diagram, we have code. There's a thing in between the visual design, the UX, and the architecture that describes how data, how your customer moves through your system. That's a very powerful thing, understanding what interactions occur when your customer does something with the system. If you don't understand this, it's very difficult to see flaws in APIs and modules. If you don't understand this up front, it's difficult to design modules that are useful. You will end up with integration issues, or you will end up with very angry UX people, or customers, which is even worse. Argue about the workflows. Make sure that everybody understands what the workflows are. Bring them to the business and make sure that the business agrees. That's a fun one. If you can get 
stakeholders from business in a meeting to talk about software workflows and how a customer experience is going to work through an application. That's interesting because again, when a CEO asks a really insightful question about your API, your head explodes for a moment, but you learn something, you change your design. This sounds an awful lot like big upfront design, doesn't it? It's not what I'm talking about, but it sounds a lot like doing work before you start doing work. It sounds a lot like architecture. So we take the time to elaborate generic bits and document the approach to generic things by creating example code. This is a successful architecture pattern. If you do only one thing as an architect, this is the most important thing that you can do, is not ignore error handling and API structure and logging, instrumentation, because this shit always gets left to the end, it never gets done well, and then it, how do you diagnose the problem? Everybody's doing error handling differently. You know, like, it, uh, well, so we just found out that uh, one of the developers has been wrapping an exception object in uh, another object, and so none of the error handling routines use it properly. Who's had that problem? I've had that problem. It's a bad problem. It's an expensive problem. Why is the customer seeing an internal error message? Because we didn't think about it up front. Well, you know what? That's not true. We did think about it up front, but we thought that's really easy. Everybody knows how to solve that problem. These are the ones that nobody will spend the time on. We won't spend the time on it ourselves. If you, as a designer, as somebody who's responsible for the development of the product, will not think about the small bits, neither will your team. And that is a bad thing. We're all part of the team. We're all trying to make this work right. So if we ensure that these things are known and understood up front, it makes all of our jobs easier because we don't have to track it down at the end. Integration, whatever. The end of a sprint, it's a pain in the ass. The end of a project, it's an even bigger one. So for me, this is the most important takeaway is that what an architecture document or what architecture should be is workflow diagrams, uh, simple approaches to, well, well-documented example code approaches to solving generic problems, and a philosophy for solving big problems. Because you know what? We all have good teams, I hope. Good teams are really, really good at digging into hard problems. They're going to come up with good solutions to hard problems but they're gonna ignore the simple bits because that's human nature. We're interested in the hard things. We all wanna dig into the big, big problems. But we create big, big problems for ourselves by ignoring the small ones. And then, this is another architecture success pattern. As an architect, be part of the team, contribute code, make an example. If you're a senior developer who's acting as an architect, if you're a team lead who's acting as an architect, a manager acting as an architect, that's a bad one. I do that, it's really hard. Um, that's, you, you need to be part of the team contributing code. You need to be subjected to code reviews just like everybody else. Your ideas need to be challenged. It's a good thing, it's how we learn. So, architecture. We design for massive scale within the parameters of our market, of course. So, being realistic. What is the addressable opportunity here? How big is this product going to be? How big may it be? Do we have a potential market of a billion users? Or is the overall market a billion users? And really our addressable opportunity is 15,000 users. <clears throat> what is it that massive scale means for us? The maximum success potential of our product. We need to make sure that our design addresses that. Again, I expect this to be something of a controversial statement because that sounds like overbuilding. That sounds like over-engineering a system. But it turns out it's really, really easy to deploy multiple services on a single server. But if you didn't design with scale in mind, it's really, really hard to deploy multiple systems that look like one. So we designed for massive scale it's within the constraints of our market, whatever that means. If that means that for us, sharding based on subdomains is actually a reasonable scaling model, then we may have addressed our scaling problem. If it means that it's not, well, how are we going to approach that? Where are our points of scale? Where are going to be our points of pain? Where are going to be the maintenance issues that we run across? And when? 
how far out can we defer solving these problems? The answer is we can defer many of them a long way, but if we don't know how we're going to eventually solve them, we won't build the system to support that. So the other thing, obviously, we want to learn, but take the time to make sure that your developers' environments look like your eventual production environment. If you're going to be deploying behind a load balancer and your developers' systems do not have a load balancer on them, that's going to be a problem. And it, it's kind of expensive up front to deploy a big system with a load balancer and a whole bunch of multiple modules. But I actually did this myself two weeks ago in Amazon. Uh, three servers, one that's running databases, one that's running four instances of Apache, and uh, the load balancer. And that's it. But we have uh, two API servers, two UI servers, uh, three MySQL servers, and two MongoDB servers on those boxes. And this is a development environment, which I can clone for multiple developers, and it's cheap. It took me a bit of time up front, but also, in order to solve this problem, I had to write some deployment scripts. Guess how much pain that saved me in about six months? A lot. Um, okay, so I'm going to transition now from uh, lecturing boringly to going through some pictures of things that worked well for me in the past. But I'll give people an opportunity to uh, throw punches and or questions at this point before we continue. Anybody? How do you define the ice cream? I define, uh, the question is, how do I define lightweight architecture? Um, I try not to. Uh, lightweight is, uh, is effectively as little as you can get away with within the context of your project. Um, we don't want to not do it, but we don't want to do more than we have to. And is that a definition? It's not. Uh, I've tried to, I've sort of tried to define it a little bit here by saying it's incomplete. So we don't bother writing down solutions to problems that we trust our team to solve. You know, so we're solving, we're writing down solutions to the simple things that are generic, that never get done right, and we're documenting workflows, and we've got a visual design of the system. That's pretty lightweight. Like it, it's for me, if you have less than that, you don't have an architecture. Does, does that help? Okay. <clears throat> what do you usually do to actually prevent system to be untestable from the beginning? Because the testability, if you don't really put it up front in your design, in your architecture, it's actually going to be very hard to accomplish later during the construction. What we learned, like, during the architecture, during the analysis and elaboration, you should, like, involve a little bit of this testability approaches and maybe think up front and write some of the unit tests or maybe behavior driven or maybe some behavior or maybe some PR thing. Did you have any uh, experience with this and what did you actually personally do to accomplish this testability up front? You know I'm a testability maniac, remember? I right? do. So. <laughs> uh, okay, so the, the, the question was, I'm not going to reiterate all of it because I can't. Effectively, how do you ensure testability up front? Yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I guess the answer to that question is you make it part of your architecture. So if you if testability is an important aspect of your system, then and testability is one of the simple things that we all know how to solve that never gets done right. That should be part of the example code that the architect does up front. This is what our testability pattern is. So to begin with, SOA is really, really testable. Right? We've got a bunch of individual modules that have lovely APIs that we can treat as black boxes and prove that they're manipulating data in the way that we like. Yay, SOA! Uh, but second of all, uh, testability within the code. So TDD is a, you know, is a, a popular approach, which I will say, uh, although I'm not prejudiced against, I have never seen done well. Uh, and part of that is that I have never done it well. So I've never really been able to drive it well in any of my teams. Uh, I've never had anybody in one of my teams really come forward and say, TDD is really, really important to me. So we've taken different approaches. Um, having a software engineer in test is, I think, a really important aspect of testability. Uh, and it's been a success pattern on a couple of projects that I've been with, specifically SOA type projects, where we have somebody who is a software engineer who's attached to the QA team, who builds tools to blow the crap out of the tools that the developers are building and they do it because they're the best developer in the room. That's a lot of fun, and that's a really good way to drive testability in your system, is to have software engineers challenging your other software engineers in my experience. Thanks.
What are you doing with database design? With database design? Because uh, APD relationship models require everything up front. ERD, okay, so what am I doing about database design? Because ERD requires everything up front. Agreed. Um, so, I hate ERDs. I love, par I love partial ERDs. Uh, so, I, the way, the approach that, that we've taken on the past few projects, which, and I will put an asterisk on it, it has so far been appropriate, or has been uh, so far been successful, it's a new, new <coughs> approach for us, is taking each of the complex workflows, the most complicated parts of the system, and pushing them down into a partial ERD. So not the entire entity, but defining the relationships and the interaction between the entities in the database. So people understand what the objects are, not necessarily what they contain, but what the objects are, how they relate to the API, how they relate to the interaction. So it becomes part, effectively part of the workflow diagram. And I actually do have, I've got an example of one of them in an example slide. So I'll, I'll come back to that and show you what it looks like. I don't know, I don't know how scalable it is yet. These are so relatively are large projects that we're using them on, but. Are you treating your database as a, you know, here's the interface, now how should the database look like? Or are you modeling the database according to the real world? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the Or are, are you modeling the database according to the real world? Because it looks to me that you are building the database based on the UI. Absolutely. Yeah, so the, the follow-up question was, uh, are we designing the database as a standalone entity, or are we modeling it based on the UI needs? Yeah, yeah. so we're modeling it based on the needs of the user. Absolutely. That's the approach that, that we're taking right now. You are I recognize that that can be extremely dangerous. <laughs> so, uh, having worked with some really, really excellent DBAs, I know that that's not a great approach at all times. So, this is again where minimum viability of your design becomes important. If your application has major performance constraints with the database, or if your application is database driven, if the database is actually driving out to the customer, you may need to take a bunch of time up front to figure out what your database looks like. And so, what I'm trying to say overall here is the only rules about doing this are making sure that you're thinking about what your problems are going to be in the future. I'm not trying to tell you how to solve individual problems. If your major constraint is, holy shit, this database is really complicated. You know that because you've talked about what your problem set is. You might want to spend some time up front looking at your database. It's a reasonable thing to do. Build some prototypes. Scale it out a bit. See what happens when you throw 100,000 users at it. This is an important thing to do. It's a good question. One more. Does this minimal viable design apply to large system migrations? <laughs> Does this minimum viable design apply to large system migrations? Ah, that's a great question. Ah, so who loves migrations? <laughs> Yeah, so the answer is, if you used it to define the system that you're migrating to, it certainly can, because migration can be a major constraint on the platform that you're building, and it certainly has been on five or six platforms that I've built, and it's caused major database headaches. <laughs> so, understand, you know, understanding up front that the, the migration was going to be a huge part of the problem that we faced going to production, uh, again, the project that we've taken, the partial database uh, design approach to, has uh, also a, um, a migration aspect that's part of the architecture, part of the upfront design. Is how are we going to get data from the existing system into something new? And obviously we can't map field A to field B, but we can understand how the existing system works and what it is that is required to bring across the minimum bit. If you need everything, well then you need to understand how the system does everything. That's extremely expensive. But if it's the biggest risk, if you need to be able to do your migration <coughs> in three weeks, then you better spend some time designing that. So yes, yeah, that's good questions today. It's fun. Okay, uh, so we got 20 minutes left in the presentation time, so I'm gonna carry on to show you some pictures of things that have worked well for me. <clears throat> I don't know how much it's actually showing up pretty well. Um, this is actually one of my favorite design exercises. Um, so let me uh, have to explain a little bit of context how we got here. 
Uh, so this is, as you can see, it's a, it's a collection of wireframes. Maybe you can't see. Uh, it's a collection of iOS wireframes. Uh, so we had this, this uh, we've gone through huge elaboration process with, uh, with our interaction designer, who's extremely talented. And you know, we've gone through, this is, this is what we need, talk to the customers, this is what they need, get some wireframes together, you know, do some touch through uh, feedback sessions with users, et cetera, et cetera. And we came back and you know, we're just like, we're, we're so pumped, so excited about this thing. We've got this great design that we're starting on. We're, you know, we're just about to start implementation. And somebody who hadn't been previously involved in the project looked at the stack of wireframes that was like two inches high and said, what the hell are you guys doing? Like, this doesn't look like anything that I would want to use. And so we sort of looked at it and so we're building a, it was a, a mobile ordering app. Well, I've got a screenshot of it on the next page uh, for, uh, for, for food, uh, for quick service food. Um, and it had 85 screens. It was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. Like, it, the amount of complexity in this tool was insane. And, and the best part was that the founder of the company had pitched this deck to the board as an MVP. <laughs> so that was really fun. Um, but yeah, so basically what we did was we took, like, we, we sort of had a little bit of a panic. And thought, well, so how can we knock complexity out of the system? So we put all of the wireframes up on a wall, all of them. And it, like this, it's tough to tell scale here because it's an iPhone photo, but we, it covered the entire wall and I had to go around the corner to the other side of the wall. This is actually fun three-dimensional yarn. Um, it's quite confusing until we contracted it down to this. But basically what we did was we walked through every interaction that a customer would need to take. Logging in, making an order, uh, you know, finding a receipt, et cetera, et cetera. And we traced it in Yarn, what they needed to do to get there. And it was really enlightening, because you see these huge, like, seven pins in a piece of Yarn to make an order. That's stupid. Like, why does it take me more than three interactions to order something? It doesn't make any sense at all. So we compressed it and compressed it and compressed it until we had truly a minimal set of, of interactions, which also turned out to be a really beautiful design that cut so much complexity out of what we were doing, we pulled two months out of our estimates for finishing the project. Two months! How big was it team? How big was it? It was six people, six developers. So, um, so it's like pretty impressive, right? But for me, anyway. So how do you solve the things that you took out to be still available for the user if they want to? So how do we solve what we took out to be still available for the users? It turned out that a bunch of it was extraneous crap. It was just not required at all. And the stuff that wasn't extraneous crap, we integrated into other screens because it turned out we were asking for too much information. We were asking them to do too many things. We were, we'd broken it down into two fine steps, and we'd locked into these very fine steps of how to do things. Does this sound like sprints to anybody? Um, sorry. <coughs> Tick there. Um, so yeah, the way, the way, we made sure that everything was still available, but we did it in a way that made much more sense because we could see it. And this is what, when I'm talking about writing it down using a whiteboard, you need to understand what it is that you are accomplishing with your system. And if you can do it like in a visual way like this, this is a relatively simple system. There's no way SAP could do something like this. Although I'd love to see it. <laughs> but doing this exercise costs one dead tree, one pack of sticky notes, uh, four rolls of yarn at a dollar store, and a dollar thing of tax, like pins. So it was really cheap, it was super energizing, everybody on the team walked away from this with a complete understanding of what the system was going to do. Very, very powerful. Um, these are really great design documents. This is my favorite kind of design document. It's a UI. UI tells us everything we need to know about what a user is going to do with the system if it's done right. UIs, in my opinion, are the place where we start with design. And we never start building something unless we know what the UI looks like, if there is one. Guess what? REST API is also a UI if you're using a computer. So the learning is understand your interfaces. You don't understand your interfaces, you do not understand your system. 
full stop. These are my favorite design documents. This is another one of my favorite design documents. So this is actually the project that we have on the go right now where we've got the, the partial database design that we've started with. Um, this is also a design document. This is um, from the UX guy who is also the graphic design guy who is also the lead UI developer. Anybody that has people like that, uh, love them and pay them as much as you can and make sure that they're challenged. And they're so rare and so beautiful and they make your life so easy because they can do things like this. This is a mock-up that took him one day and we're all able to play with it. This has is fully interactive. This is just HTML5 and CSS3 and it literally took him a day and we were all able to play with a significant component of the system and see what it looks like and feels like and feedback on it and change it. Hugely, hugely powerful. We took this to customers who sat down in front of it and played with it and went, I don't really like the way XYZ feels. Crap, days work and we can do this? It's amazing. And this is a lean thing in many ways, but this should be an agile thing. This should be a thing that we take outside of the sprint. We do before we begin executing. We have prototypes that we can touch and feel. And again, this could be an API. This could be a database. This could be any component of the system that you need to know how it works, how it's going to feel to interact with. This is an important design document. And I'll tell you, the guys that are building the back end of this system know exactly what the API looks like, and know exactly what the database looks like for these components of the system. Um, so this is the same system that is completely illegible, I'm very sorry. Uh, but it, this is a, the same system. This is the most complicated workflow in the entire system. And without explaining in great depth what it is, it's effectively an approvals process where N groups of N people can be organized in N sets of priority to approve, right? in, in N channels that are serialized, can be organized to approve an item that is flowing through the system. And that is what the workflow looks like. Period. The CEO looked at this, she read it through and went, hmm, I get that. It sounded really complicated when you were talking about it in the whiteboard. Okay. This is a really powerful design document. It's a really powerful piece of architecture. Developers get it, the business gets it. It's a powerful piece. This is a powerful uh, agile artifact where all the stakeholders understand what we're building. This is one of the core architecture diagrams for that system. Come at me, I drew this. It's my architecture diagram. That is an architecture diagram, believe it or not. It describes how a customer interacts with the system in a specific way, how the load balancer works, how load balancing works, how the system is clustered, how it is scaled, how the data is sharp, all in that diagram. It's a data flow diagram, it's a workflow diagram, it's an architecture diagram. It doesn't talk about what platform we're going to deploy it on. It doesn't talk about what software we're going to build to solve these problems. It talks about how the system is organized around interaction. What are the things that can happen? Well, it turns out that all of this load balancing is round robin. Very, very, very powerful thing to understand. No sticky sessions in this. So, that's the way. <coughs> this one, nope. Nobody? Really? There's no UML. <laughs> there is no UML. There's an actor at the top. <laughs> These are powerful design documents. Again, completely illegible. I don't know what I was thinking of putting these in the slide. Uh, <laughs> um, and incidentally, the, the, the deck will be on, uh, on, the, on our website to download. Uh, it's not yet, because actually I just finished it last night. Um, but uh, these are powerful design documents. One of these is a page in Confluence. So I, I'm a huge fan of uh, the Atlassian stack. Uh, I think they're fantastic tools. There are lots of other tools that are like them. Uh, the last scene is mine. I like it a lot. Um, but uh, so this is a page in Confluence which describes, uh, it basically maps down from that um, from that screenshot, that interactive screenshot that the developer, the UI developer, <coughs> it maps down to 
all of the actors that can interact with the system, all of our users, the different types of users that can inter interact with the system, and what actions they can take on the page. And that's really deep design, and I wouldn't have asked them to do it, but uh, their customer, the person that's responsible in their company for doing customer service, is so, so concerned about understanding herself what it is that the customers could do with the system that she wrote user stories. Without knowing what user stories were, she wrote a set of user, a user story matrix for the page to make sure that she understood what was going to happen, which completely blew my mind. But it's a really powerful design document. Simple one line, these are the things that everybody can do on the screen with each of these buttons. Here's what happens when they do it. Boom. We all understand what the page is. And that's their representation in Jira. Everybody knows this pattern? As a blank, I need a blank so that I can blank. Use it, own it, it's really powerful. As a customer, I need to pay you to solve my problem so that I can make more money. You become the user when you say things this way. This is important. I know that we're all soulless technology people and we don't identify with human beings. But we are human beings and we have emotions. And connecting emotionally with our user by describing ourselves as that user makes us stronger. It makes us understand more what we're doing. This is a powerful pattern and it's a well-known one. But it's funny how often we fill in the blanks and we don't read the whole statement. Your customer, as your customer, I need to do this so that I can accomplish this goal. I need to do that. So, what have we learned? We've learned a bunch of things, I hope. Uh, I hope we've also asked a lot of questions, and I hope that we're thinking a lot of things, because I don't know necessarily that I'm teaching so much as I'm provoking. That's kind of what I do. It's important that we don't fuck up learning things. It's important that we're not afraid to fail by learning. Doing things, having them explode in our faces is data. Data is our friend. Agile teaches us that data is our friend. You should know that data is our friend. It makes it easier for us to make better decisions next time. So, how do we have a minimum viable design? Minimal viable design. We make the design based on actual data that we have collected by talking to actual customers. People that will pay us money for the thing that we are building. Right? Based on building prototypes. Based on actual things. We don't make a design based on assumptions. Well, we can make one design based on assumptions, but then we take it to a customer. And then the next iteration is based on data. We make the design address the scale of our market, not somebody else's market, not Oracle's market. That's not our market. It's not my market anyway. If there's anybody in this room that's addressing the market the size of Oracle, I would like to talk to you about the presentation about our services. <laughs> it includes the UI. It includes the software. It includes the systems. If it doesn't include all of these things, it does not include all of your points of interaction. It does not include your points of interaction. It is not a viable design. To make it viable, we have to iterate it. We change it over time, just like the software that we're building. And this is a difficult thing. It's difficult to say, design up front, and then iterate your design. But this is why I say also that you need to be comfortable with this lack of completeness. Because one of the ways that you can iterate a design is by filling in as you go. If you left blank spots because you didn't know, you can fill that in when you figure out what it is that it's going to be. As long as those didn't turn out to be your highest risk areas or your biggest complexity areas, it's not a huge cost. But architecture in retrospect is not necessarily a horrible thing. Retrospective architecture can be super powerful and help you inform the next version. Viable architecture involves the entire team and everything that we learn. So, if you're designing in a vacuum, you're doing it wrong. If you're not involving everybody who needs to be executing on the things that we're learning, we're not doing it right. This is a problem. 
everybody who's going to be responsible for executing has to own the architecture. It's a difficult thing. Many architects are solitary beings. We like to have complete control over things. But I think that architects are actually teams. And somebody who has a role of architect is really a lead in the process, not an individual. Sorry, anybody who disagrees, come out. And finally, a design is not viable if you don't have an excellent team. I'm sorry, if you don't have an excellent team, then you need to do everything in your power right now to get one. Build it, fire people, hire people, train people, change your culture, change your approach. You know what? Start by involving your team in the design. You may find that you have excellent people you didn't know you had. But if you don't have an excellent team, you don't have a viable design. There's no such thing as a design that's so good that a monkey can implement it. I'm sorry, but that will end badly in my experience. So, that's it. Thanks very much for your time. I did, in fact, have a lot of fun. I wasn't sure if I was going to when I wrote this slide, but I do, in fact, still want to argue about it. So, I think that's it for me.